I'm delighted to welcome you here for this morning's webinar on the Anna May Wong Porter and the American Women Porters Program, which we'll be talking about with our distinguished panelists from the Smithsonian, from the U.S. Mint, um, as well as uh, Arizona State University. Um, this event is being run in conjunction with the School of Social Sciences and the Office of Global Engagement at UC Irvine. And I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Victoria Jones for her assistance in bringing this all together, as well as Fran Holm, who is helping us run the webinar. So thank you all. Um, this is really an exciting opportunity to reflect on what the Anna May Wong Porter means for our national money, for our national stories, and for the ongoing story creation that's involved uh, in, in the telling of tales on our money about who we are as people, what the United States is all about, its contorted political and racial histories. And, and this is really um, uh, potentially a, a, a start of a series of conversations that I think that the new quarter program has really helped to initiate. So I'm thrilled that we are joined today by Dr. Ellen Feingold, who's the curator of the National Numismatic Collection at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. Ellen will be facilitating the Q&A at the end. Dr. Karen Young, who's Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies and Asian Pacific American Studies at ASU, and the author of The China Mystique, Pearl Buck, Anna Mei Wong, Mei Ling Soon, and The Transformation of American Orientalism. Michelle Thompson and Tracy Selzer Chavez are both here from the U.S. Mint. Michelle is the program lead of the American Women Quarters Program, and Tracy is the program analyst. We also have Dr. Theodore Gonzalez, who is a UCI alum, a UCI PhD, um, and curator of Asian Pacific American history at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. And Theo is joined by Ryan Lintelman, who's the curator of the Division of Cultural and Community Life, also at the National M Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. So first, thank you to the panelists, one and all, for being willing to do this. Um, I'm very excited as a sort of money and coin geek. And um, I see among our attendees, folks that I know from other, other contexts coming from Asian American studies, coming from Numis, uh, coming from the numismatic community and, and people interested in the history of money as well. So without any further ado, we will get started. As we're going along the way, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, balloons at the bottom or in the chat, and we'll get to those as we can. But I will hand it over first to Dr. Gonzalez, who will begin by telling us a little bit about who was Anna Maywan. Theo, it's all you. Good morning, Bill. Thank you. Um, and we'll get set up here with some slides for everyone. Uh, so again, thanks to Bill Mara and to the team at UCI for gathering us today to talk about Anna Mae Wong. For those of us who may be less familiar with this pioneering Asian American film star, we thought it'd be useful to spend a few minutes to relay a condensed timeline of the actor's life. Anna Mae Wong was born in Los Angeles on January 3rd, 1905. Her birth name was Wong Lu Song. Her father was Wong Sam Singh, and her mother was Lee Gon Toy. Anna was the second of eight children. From a young age, Anna was captivated by filmmaking. She started work as an extra while still a teen. Her first starring role occurred in 1922 with The Toll of the Sea, which was a retelling of Madame Butterfly set in China instead of Japan. She was all of 17 years old. In 1924, Wong played the role of a Mongol slave girl in The Thief of Baghdad, starring Douglas Fairbanks. Many roles followed, and many involved playing minor, if not stereotypical, roles for Asian women in film. Frustrated with Hollywood, Wong headed for Europe in 1928 and found work in Berlin, Paris, and London. How did this American-born girl prepare for Europe's many languages? Easy. She learned to speak in German and in French. In 1930, Wong returned to the United States and starred on Broadway before returning to Los Angeles uh, the following year to sign a contract with Paramount Studios. And yes, the parts she continued to find were still stereotypically narrow. In 1932, Wong appeared in the film for which she is best known, Shanghai Express, along with Marlena Dietrich. It was a commercial success in the United States but Chinese government officials banned the film for what they understood to be negative portrayals of Chinese persons. The film The Good Earth 
serves as yet another turning point in her career. Wong wanted to play the lead. Uh, instead, the part of Olan went to German-American actress Louise Rayner. Hold on a second. Sorry, let me move this, this bit out. That part went to Louise Rayner. who was awarded the Oscar for Best Actress. Wong made another major overseas trip, this time to China in 1936, to visit her family. Um, this was a complicated journey, and it was also fairly well documented, with a Chinese government wrestling with the fact that stereotypical roles were being performed by a widely recognized super, superstar with a global platform. In 1937, Wong was cast in The Daughter of Shanghai, opposite Korean-American actor and friend Philip Ahn, making, marking the earliest instance in American cinema of an Asian-American couple on screen together. When was the last time you've seen an Asian-American couple in the lead of any role these days? After World War II, Wong was considering moving to the smaller screen, to television, as she was cast in the lead as a detective in the gallery of Madame Lu Song in 1951. Unfortunately, no copies of this program survived, and what a loss to our collective imagination and memory, all of those scripts and costumes and props that could remind us of what it means to see the first Asian American series, um, uh, the first uh, U.S. television series with an Asian American lead in that role. On February 3rd, 1961, Anna Mae Wong died in her Santa Monica home. She has left behind a body of work that continues to deserve attention, but more importantly, she lived a life that continues to inspire so many of us today to demand more representation. Anna Mae Wong wrote an essay in 1933. That essay was titled, I Protest. She asked, quote, why is it that the screen Chinese is nearly always a villain and so crude a villain, murderous, treacherous, a snake in the grass? We are not like that. How should we be? with a civilization that is so many times older than the West, unquote. As you can tell, there's fire in her words. Let's use that fire to light the way in today's discussion. Anna Mae Wong's questions are still relevant decades later, and I look forward to our dialogue today about this unique life and career. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Theo. Uh, Dr. Leung, let me turn to you next. Uh, and I think you're on mute. Thanks about there that. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the U.S. Mint and the Women in the Quarters program um, on uh, just point out that this is a program that's exposing the US and people around the world to women of color and women who have been incredibly important in our society and have been active in ways that many people don't know, including, including Edith Kanaka Ole, who is here and who also a UC, UCI professor, Adria Amata, Lynn Amata, has written um, about the importance of hula in the native Hawaiian culture and for the Kanaka Maoli. Um, and they were um, not allowed to perform hula um, for under US empire when Hawaii, um, the Hawaiian monarchy was overthrown. Um, I also wanted to point out that um, Patsy Takamoto Mink is been just announced to be on um, a quarter as well. She also um, grew up in Hawaii and uh, Judy Tsuchun Wu, also at UC Irvine, and Gwendolyn Mink, uh, Patsy Mink's daughter, co authored um, a really amazing book as well called Fierce and Fearless, and it talks about the importance of having someone growing up in Hawaii um, and bring that sensibility and that knowledge to um, the US uh, government. It also really highlights. Um, networks of women in Congress, women of color as well. But let me get to um, the discussion today, which is about Anna Mae Wong. And I'm showing Shirley, uh, Jennifer Lim's books and my own, um, we started doing work in the early 90s about Anna Mae Wong as part of our dissertations. Um, Shirley has written, my work went up through World War II 
And uh, Shirley, in her more recent book, Anna Mae Wong, Performing the Modern, really does more in delving into her stage career, her overseas career, and talks about the importance of femininity and modernity. And I, I wanted to acknowledge that so much of the work um, that captures these stories is the work of women of color has been inspired and built upon women of color feminism. And here we see uh, Anna Mae Wong in 40 Winks, where she played Annabelle Wu for um, a British film, and also her passport photo. She, um, as Theo has told us, was born in um, Los Angeles. And it's really interesting because Judy Young in Unbound Feet talked about Jade Snow Wong being the first second generation a Chinese American woman to write her biography. But I would argue that Anna Mae Wong in her short interview, she spoke so much about being a Chinese American, being born and raised in, in Los Angeles and her exposure to Hollywood. And I think that one of the things that's been, um, that uh, you know I remarked about in my dissertation was that she really was one of the earliest person providing these insights about the second generation Chinese American experience. There is some debate over whether she was second or third generation. I personally believe she was second generation, although there's some paper um, questions about that. Um, and so I think that what's really important is to point out again, and, and I think Theo pointed to this, was how in her interviews, Anna Mae Wong was really speaking out against anti-miscegenation law. She talked about how the anti-miscegen laws that banned interracial portrayals of romance on Hollywood um, kept her from being able to get good roles. And he has quoted from this really infamous article, um, not infamous, but really powerful, as he said, um, speaking out against the racism and about how it affected her career and limited what parts she could play, how Chinese and Chinese Americans were always limited in their roles to villains and um, how she really challenged Hollywood's marketing. And the way she did this again was by traveling. And Shirley and I both have talked about how she changed her locations. And by going to Great Britain um, in the early 30s, that gave her a platform to speak out against US racism. That was not just you know, in society, but it was especially in Hollywood as well. And you know, for many people in the United States and around the world, this might be the first time they saw someone who was Chinese American on screen. And it was limiting those roles to these really narrow, narrowly conceived perceptions limited by what was considered moral at the time. Um, and she also publicly critiqued male privilege in her um her interview. She talked about the Chinese men who had so much more power in the Chinese American community. She talked about how um, Chinese females were not always so passive, even though she often would speak of her mother's role in her early uh, interviews. So I think that in this environment, um, she, she was really using her platform in ways to speak out against racism in ways that, you know, we have not really seen often. Um, and so today she is this inspiration. Um, and she even said in 1926, my parents complained that I speak with an American accent. While on the other hand, Americans are constantly being surprised when they meet me because I speak English without a trace of the sing-song Chinese accent. Again, pushing back against the stereotype she portrayed on screen. And so she would really use this exposure um, she also said, no film lovers can ever marry me. If they got an American actress to slant her eyes and eyebrows, you know, Catherine Hepburn, Louise Ringier, and wear a stiff black wig and dress in Chinese culture, it would be all right. But me, I am really Chinese, so I must always die in the movies so that the white girl with the yellow hair may get the man. And there she's talking about that white heterosexual romance that was is still so dominant in Hollywood, um, although it's being challenged in really important ways. And she said that as early as 1931. So she was not afraid of speaking out. And in fact, her first interracial kiss was in the British film Piccadilly, but they had to remove it because of US censorship laws and because so much of the market was in the United States. Um, when she went to uh, China, her life was really this, you know, within a context of Chinese American history and Chinese Asian American studies. We know that 
she really, her life gives us a window on the changing ways in which geopolitical relations continue, even today, to shape Asian Americans' experiences. So when she first started, China was sort of looked down upon. China was invaded by Japan with Manchuria. She became very involved in the, in the Chinese war efforts to raise money for China. So she was involved in United China Relief um, that sort of emerged in World War II. And she um, raised money continually. She was really proud of these films in which she, again, as Theo pointed out, played Chinese American characters. She was a nurse. Um, in, in one of the films, and then she was um, these undercover U.S. agents with Philip Ahn in another film. She also, during the World War II, was in two producer releasing corporation films, Bombs Over Burma and Lady of Ch uh, from Chongqing, and she played a guerrilla um, leader in one sort of modeled after sort of a Madame Chiang Kai-shek character, actually more her sister Ching Ling, and she was uh, leading the guerrillas. And this was a time when many Chinese Americans were cast as Japanese villains. And so what's really interesting in Bombs Over Burma is that it was white actors in yellow face who played the Japanese villain, the villainous soldiers as they were seen. And so, you know, even there you see that she's making these really important um, moves in countering these longstanding casting decisions in Hollywood as well. Even so, with all her activism, with all her known raising money for, for China's efforts, when she went to China, she was met with a lot of pushback by the nationalist Chinese. They were very aware of their national reputation and portrayal, and so much was based on this popular representations and what they saw as humiliating and demeaning. In fact, they were, they were racist depictions. And so she, you know, was, she talked, described going to a banquet that she thought was in her, you know, that she would be able to share her experiences and learn from them. And she said it ended up that they berated her about her portrayals. They berated her about being, you know, as she described in an interview about her father saying, you know, she was this half-dressed prostitute. He said, you know, some of her picture, her portrayals embarrassed the family, embarrassed the community. And so she, you know, said that she really, spoke to them and said, I told them when a person is trying to get established in a profession, he can't choose parts. He has to take what is offered. Later on in 1937, as to the medium I am playing and I have no choice in the matter. One has to take which is available. And we know this is true. We know this with Hattie McDaniel. We know this with um, Dorothy Dandridge. We know this with other actors, Paul Robeson, who was, she was friends with. Um, but she also spoke out when she was in that Daughter of Shanghai as that doctor. She said, I feel that the real Chinese should be shown to audiences in the world, if only to correct film impressions of the past. And so with this thought in mind, I am happy to appear in Daughter of Shanghai. And, you know, she donated. She was known for, again, being such a supporter. Here you see a picture of her at the Chinese Moon Festival signing autographs. Even though Hollywood would really not cast her in central roles, they always asked her to prepare in central roles for raising money for China, even though the Chinese government was somewhat reluctant to embrace her. She always was there, always raising funds. And this cartoon that talks about the screens, you know, all the work she did, how she turned it around, she kept portraying in this cartoon even notes how much she dedicated to China and how she really was pushing against those stereotypes. So I think it's so important that we recognize that she was an activist. She was an early activist, often because her Hollywood career, and she's seen as this glamorous star that often eclipses her passion, her commitment, and her, her fight for social justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And um, now I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Midgelman at the Smithsonian, who's been collecting and curating um, around the life of Anna Mae Wong, together with Anna Mae Wong's niece, Anna Wong, who is actually here. Um, and maybe later we can see if we can bring her in to say a few words if she's willing. Ryan? Yes, we'd love to hear from you, Anna. Thanks for uh, popping up in the chat and giving us some historical context as we go along here. Uh, that's been really fun to, to play on with. Um, so I'm Ryan Lintelman. I'm a curator of the Entertainment Collection at the National Museum of American History. Um, three of us who are here today are curators at the museum. So I thought I'd give you a little overview of the museum and how and why we collect entertainment, and then share some exciting new objects uh, in our collection with you all. 
Those of you who have been to Washington, D.C. know that the Smithsonian isn't just a single museum, but it's actually 21 different museums uh, that cover everything from art and culture to science and history. And the American History Museum is here uh, on the National Mall, as you see. And we're best known for a few of the big objects, uh, including the Star Spangled Banner, which is the original flag from Baltimore's Fort McHenry in the War of 1812 that inspired the national anthem. Uh, you can see George Washington's final uniform here from the Army, uh, Abraham Lincoln's hat, which he wore to Ford's Theater on the night of his assassination in 1865, and the Greensboro Woolworths lunch counter, where four Black college students staged an important 1960 sit-in. We're also known for these objects, though, and when many visitors enter the museum, they immediately find the visitor services desk and they ask, where's the pop culture exhibit? Um, you know, these are uh, Dorothy's red slippers, ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz, the 1939 film, and Jim Henson's original 1955 Kermit puppet. Uh, so we have a collection of Jim Henson's Muppets. Um, now, you know, you could ask, are these objects any less important than or more important than the objects that I showed you on the last slide? As an entertainment curator, it's my job to say that they are just as important as those objects of political and military history. Uh, that helped to define the nation's history and culture. I think that there's something to be said for these costumes and props that make up the entertainment collection that I oversee. Um, they're more meaningful than just, you know, prompting nostalgia. I think that these objects from movies, television, theater, and other forms of entertainment help us to understand the world around us. They communicate values, they demonstrate behavior, they shape our identity and our conception of others, and they provoke conversation about contemporary events and issues. They create a shared cultural vernacular that unites this diverse nation. And of course, one of the major issues in the history of American entertainment is representation, as we've been talking about today. When all the heroes that you see in popular entertainment are white men, for instance, or when the only Asian women you see in film are reduced to a few stereotypical roles, those harmful stereotypes limit viewers' imagination and possibilities of, and capabilities of their fellow Americans. And they deny them the full humanity while enabling racist prejudice in broader society. Issues of race and representation in American entertainment are central to the work that we do at the museum, especially in our new permanent exhibition, Entertainment Nation, which just opened in December. This exhibit explores how music, sports, and entertainment have shaped our conversations about historical and political change over the past 150 years. You'll find many of the best loved objects in the museum here, including the Ruby Slippers and the Muppets, the droids from Star Wars, the shackles from Roots, Archie Bunker's chair, Prince's guitar you see in the foreground here. Um, but this exhibit will be on view for decades to come. So we've been working hard to grow the collection, uh, working with donors who have objects of historical significance from the history of entertainment and showing how the most important entertainers, films, shows and events that have impacted American history uh, have, have actually shaped the conversations that we have in the historical moment. So one of the most significant stories that we had no objects to help tell the story of was Anna Mae Wong. Luckily, Anna Mae Wong's niece, also named Anna, who's here with us today, has taken on the job of managing her aunt's legacy. She's been working with researchers, filmmakers, curators, and even the US Mint, as you'll hear, to ensure that Anna Mae Wong's story is told and understood. At an event at the museum in December, we were very honored to receive a donation of objects from Anna for the museum's permanent collection. We received, as you see here, Anna Mae Wong's makeup box, cigarette case, and calling cards. These are among the few objects from Anna's, uh, Anna Mae Wong's life that remained in the family's possession. Because uh, as Dr. Leung just said, you know, she was very interested in China relief during the war, actually sold off uh, many of her costumes from films and other objects that relate to her career. But we're very happy to have these objects because I think they speak to not only Anna Mae Wong's life and career, her significance in history, and the way that she created this sort of complex identity and um, fashioned herself as a glamorous modern cosmopolitan movie star, but also an identity as a Chinese American woman. She purchased and used these objects with their Chinese uh, design motifs, just as she made a point of dressing in beautiful Asian style gowns. So I think you see here sort of the, the everyday life that she lived, as well as her aspirations and her ability to create this glamorous you know, lifestyle that she lived. Um, we were really excited in particular to have this makeup kit because so much of the story of um, Asian American representation in, in entertainment 
um, focuses on yellow face, you know, uh, white actors who use makeup to perform as Asian women uh, or Asian characters um, in, in films and television all the way up to recent years. Um, and this makeup kit, although it doesn't contain the makeup that Anna Mae Wong used, um, helps us to understand the way that she was able to fashion herself and create an image of herself as a Chinese American woman, a movie star. Interestingly, the only other makeup kit that we have in the collection at the museum is John Wayne's makeup kit that he used on True Grit, which includes some makeup with labels on them as Arab or Chinese. So you can see the way that even as big a star as John Wayne was involved in this um, horrible practice of yellow face and, and misrepresentation in American film. Um, so this is a, a, an object that helps speak to the way that Anna Mae Wong was able to push back and try to open the door to create more authentic representation and, and, um, and, and you know, to, to broaden the types of representation of Asian American women you see in American film. We also love these, these cards, uh, the calling card. We collected two so that we can display them at the same time. You see uh, on one side, um, you see Anna's Wong, Anna Mae Wong's name uh, in English and then in Chinese script on the back. Uh, so we can display these together and show that she was representing herself uh, in both parts of her identity and the way that she she wanted to be seen. Um, now, I showed you the, the Entertainment Nation exhibition where we're hoping to exhibit these. But in the meantime, in May, um, we have some new acquisitions cases at the museum where we highlight some of the, the new objects that we brought in. So you see two of those here from recent years, um, the off-red costume from The Handmaid's Tale and, uh, and gown from Crazy Rich Asians. Um, but in May, we're actually going to be able to exhibit these Anna Mae Wong objects here at the museum, um, just in time for Asian, uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And um, so you'll be able to come to the museum and see them there, uh, represented with a beautiful Carl Bev Ecton photograph of, of or sorry, Nicholas Murray photograph of Anna Mae Wong. Um, and, uh, and then you'll be able to see them at the museum for years to come. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, those of us on the West Coast are going to have to make the trip um, and come east to see these fantastic objects that you are collecting and putting on display for all of us. Um, now let's move to the quarter itself and the American Women Quarters Program. I will turn it over to Michelle Thompson and Tracy Sela Chavez from the U.S. Mint. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, indeed. Perfect. OK, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are so excited to be a part of this webinar, um, not only to learn even more about the fantastic anime Wong, but also to be able to share some more information about this historic and groundbreaking quarters program. So before I jump into the quarters, um, just a little background. The United States Mint is the largest mint in the world. We are responsible for designing and minting all circulating coins. Um, circulating coins are the coins that you're going to receive back and change when you make a purchase. We also design and manufacture numismatic coins and metals. Those are the coins and metals purchased by collectors. They've never been in circulation, have unique finishes or metal content, and are produced on a smaller scale. And we have bullion coins, which are investment grade precious metals. But let's jump into the quarter program. So in 2019, the US Mint began brainstorming potential themes for a new quarters program because the America the Beautiful quarters program, which was running for 12 years, would be ending in 2021. Knowing this, we began to draft legislation. So I don't know how much you guys know, but the Mint needs legislation to be passed into law before we can change any circulating coins. The end result was the Circulating Collectible Coin Redesign Act of 2020, which became law in January of 2021. For those of you interested in reading it, it's Public Law 116-330. And it lays out nine years of circulating coins, starting with the American Women Quarters Program. So this program is groundbreaking and it's historical. It's a four-year program starting in 2022 and running through 2025. And each year of the program, the Mint will issue five quarters, so 20 total quarters for this program. And the reverse or the tail side of each quarter will all be different. Each will represent an accomplishment or contribution of one prominent woman from the United States. It's actually required in the law that the women who are honored are diverse, ethnically, racially, geographically, across time periods, and even in their respective fields. 
So in 2022, we honored a celebrated author with Maya Angelou, a physicist and astronaut with Dr. Sally Ride, an activist in Nina Otero Warren, a suffragist, I'm sorry, an activist in, in Willow Mankiller. Um, Nina Tara Warren was also an activist, though, a suffragist with Nina Tara Warren. And finally, Anna Mae Wong, the Chinese American actress that we are all here to talk about today. In 2023, we are honoring a pioneering pilot in Bessie Coleman, a Hawaiian composer, chanter, and teacher in Edith Kanaka Ole, a leader in human rights movement, Eleanor Roosevelt, a Mexican American journalist in Jovita Adar and America's first prima ballerina in Maria Talchief. So far in 2022, we have shipped more than 2.5 billion American women quarters to the Federal Reserve Bank. So that, that's an awful lot of these quarters to be out there, which we're very excited about. So as you can imagine, determining who to honor in this program is truly a daunting task. I'm sure that if each of us were to create a list of 20 women that we should be honoring in this program, we may have some overlap in our lists, but I highly doubt that any two lists would be identical. The Mint is not an expert in women's history, so we work with people who are. The public law authorizes us to consult with three different groups, the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum, the National Women's History Museum, and the Congressional Bipartisan Women's Caucus. Now by law, the designs may not feature any living person and thus all of the women we're honoring are deceased. We also went ahead and solicited recommendations from the general public through a web portal hosted by the National Women's History Museum. And we saw thousands of submissions come in. People are really excited about this program and have ideas on who they would like to see honored on their coins. We then take these consolidated recommendations for the five women and we send them annually to the secretary. And ultimately, it is Secretary Yellen who determines the final selection of women to honor each year. So we talked a little bit about how this program is honoring five women annually on the reverses, but there's another secret story that I'd like to share. Um, we're actually honoring another woman in the choice of the obverse design or the head side of the tail of the quarter. This design was created by the renowned sculptor Laura Garden Frazier and will be featured on all of the American women quarters. Now those in the coin collecting community will probably recognize her name, but for people who aren't aware, the story behind the obverse is significant and I'd like to take a minute and share it. Laura Garden Fraser was an accomplished sculptor in the early to mid 1900s. She was actually the first woman to design a US coin. Um, this was the Alabama Centennial Half Dollar in 1921. And she also designed numerous congressional gold medals. This Fraser sculpt of George Washington has a very unique history. So in 1931, there was a competition to design the quarter dollar obverse to celebrate the bicentennial of George Washington's birth. She created a stunning design and it was selected by both the Commission of Fine Arts and the Washington Bicentennial Commission. However, the treasury secretary at the time, that was Secretary Mellon, selected John Flanagan's design, which you're all very familiar with. It has been on the quarter since 1932, which is a modified version of it being used throughout up to uh, 2021. Laura Garden Fraser's design was eventually featured on a gold coin in 1999. This was a commemorative gold coin created to mark the bicentennial of Washington's death. Now, a gold coin is beautiful. It's collected by numismatists, but to be frank, not all of us have gold coins. So honoring her by having her design as the obverse on the circulating quarters program is, is fitting. It's almost like getting the Fraser design where it was supposed to originally be, in the homes and hands of every American. So at this point, I'd love to turn it over to my colleague, Tracy Selza. Thank you so much, Michelle. Through their extraordinary specialized artistry, U.S. Mint artists face the challenge of expressing the values, the aspirations, and the shared heritage of our nation, communicating the essence and the story of America to the world, all on the canvas the size of a quarter. I'd like to bring the Mint's artistic heritage to life by briefly talking about the coin design process 
and then diving into the artist who designed and sculpted the Anime Wong Quarter. The Office of Design Management at the United States Mint is responsible for managing the design development process for all of our country's new coins. Once a law is passed, our design managers liaise with legislative stakeholders, the honorees families, and other subject matter experts. For the Anime Wong Quarter, design manager Pam Bohr worked closely with Anime Wong's niece, Anna Wong, who was so generous in her time and expertise, allowing us to gather source materials and background information for our artists to use on the creation of candidate designs. Once the designs are submitted, the U.S. Mint conducts several reviews. And Mint design managers really act as neutral stewards throughout this process. So there's a legal review to ensure that the designs meet requirements of the authorizing law and follow copyright laws. The U.S. Mint chief engraver provides feedback for artistic and technical improvements. A coinability check considers elements that would not appear too well when they're struck in metal, such as letters that are too small or perhaps too close together. All this feedback is shared with the artist. Throughout the process, design managers continue to work closely with key stakeholders, such as the Smithsonian, to ensure the designs are produced appropriately and capture the honorees' legacy. The design choices go through further reviews by the Mint, stakeholders named in the authorizing law, and two federal advisory committees, the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee and the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts. The committee recommendations are sent to the Secretary of the Treasury, who selects the final design. Once the final design is selected, the Mint's chief engraver assigns the sculpting of the piece. So that's the process of transforming that flat two-dimensional design into a three-dimensional sculpt. And he or she assigns it to one of the five medallic artists on staff. I'd like to take some time to highlight the designer of the Anime Wong Quarter. Emily is part of the Mint's artistic infusion program. The Mint contracts talented professional American artists who represent very diverse backgrounds and interests. These artists work with Mint staff to create and submit new coins for our coins and medals. And as you can see from this very long list of design credits, Emily has designed a variety of coins from, from collectible coins to circulating coins to even commemorative coins. She holds an MFA in science illustration from the University of Michigan and embarked on a career as a freelance illustrator. She's produced illustrations for science publications, museums, and zoos. And when she talked about why she joined the artist, artistic infusion program, she said that coin and metal design is a really competitive field. And it really demands that she delivers her very best work. She enjoys the diversity of subject matter and she gets a satisfaction from the challenge of visual storytelling. As we go into the next slide, we see the design of the anime wand quarter. We see that she's resting her head on her hand and she's surrounded by the lights of a bright marquee sign. The inscriptions are United States of America, Anime Wong, Quarter Dollar, and E Plurius Unum. In seeking a way to show that Anime Wong was a film star, the artist Emily Damstra looked for inspiration of movie posters in the era. At some point, she found a photo of a theater marquee and she saw the actor's name surrounded by light. It gave her the idea to incorporate that in her coin design. And it seems like a great way to honor Anime Wong. When asked about the design, Emily said, I illustrated a close up of Anime Wong's face in order to showcase the features that made her so glamorous and so memorable. Her characteristic smoothly sculpted hairdo, her narrow expressive eyebrows, her elegant eyes and lips. I noticed she was often photographed with her hands stylishly held near her face. So I included her hand resting on the theater marquee. She imagined the United States of America, where you see on, on the upper portion of the coin, um, to really serve as a theater name. And quarter dollar towards the bottom of the design would be the movie, movie title. With one finger casually directing attention to her name, the pose might suggest she has been she's been waiting for the kind of acceptance that being on a United States coin could finally bring. Emily was also very um, influenced and impressed by Anime Wong's ambition, persistence, and work ethic. 
she was um, inspired by publicity photos of her and also um, the her face and expressive gestures that really captured movie movie audiences. She really wanted to make sure the coin design paid tribute to what captured movie audiences then as well as now. As we move to the next slide, I'd like to highlight John McGraw. John is the art mint artist who turned Emily's two-dimensional line drawing into a three-dimensional sculpt. John received a Bachelor's of Arts in Sculpture and Graphic Design from Rutgers University in Camden. He continued his, knowledge, his thirst for knowledge and creativity that led him to pursue a 3D digital artistry. He became an instrumental figure in 3D digital design culture at Lenox, China. He leveraged those traditional sculpting skills that he had fine-tuned with his 3D digital artistry, creating design concepts, dinnerware services, and figurative sculptures for brands ranging from Kate Spade to Disney. He joined the Mint in 2014 as a product design specialist and became a medallic artist in March 2020. As we go to the next slide, we see John in action sculpting. So United States Mint metallic artists can use traditional media, so that would be clay and plaster or digital software or even a combination to create the coin model. The final digital model is used to carve the design in steel using computerized tooling, producing a master hub, which makes the die to stamp the coin. And as we go to the next slide, um, we're provided a little insight of what this assignment meant to him. John said he's honored to have sculpted the design honoring iconic actress Anna Mae Wong. Her forward facing portrait is reminiscent of a theatrical mask and added to the challenge when sculpting a portrait in such low relief. As we go to the, the next slide, I wanted to, to talk about the impact the this quarter has had in society. The Mint has produced 464,000, more than 464,000 million quarters. The release of this quarter has been picked up from news articles in Vanity Fair. It was trending in Yahoo. I think one of the, the most um, wonderful things has been participating in the public events. This photo was actually from a public event that um, we worked very closely with Anna Wong with and the Smithsonian National Women's History Museum um, partners at the Paramount Studios. We had a screening of Shanghai Express and a panel discussion. Um, I think a highlight was seeing the members of the public's reaction to receiving the quarters. Every attendee received a quarter. And I think we will continue to see how meaningful having this quarter in circulation um, and telling Anna Mae Wong's story in this way will be. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Michelle Thompson. Thanks, Tracy. So a coin should reflect the shared heritage and values of our nation. And women have been extremely underrepresented on US circulating coins. Now, although our nation's coins have featured mythical representations of Lady Liberty from the 1790s, there have been very few circulating coins with named women on them. There was the Susan B. Anthony dollar in, 17, in 1979 and the Sacagawea golden dollar in 2020. These two coins remain the only circulating coins with women on the obverse or the head side. Helen Keller was on the reverse of the 2003 Alabama state quarter as part of the 50 state quarters program. And there have been numerous numismatic coins featuring women like the two Native American $1 coins you see here. Women have also been featured on numismatic coins that you may purchase from a U.S. Mint online site or a coin dealer. But why does this matter? Well, it matters because women matter. We have never had a circulating program solely dedicated to celebrating American women and their achievements, their journeys, the tenacity and spirit that these women showed. So I thank you for coming and allowing us to talk about this quarter program. I hope you look for the American Women Quarters in your change or purchase them online. Um, and thank you for letting us be a part of this. Thank you both so much. This is just so illuminating. Um, and if we can bring up our panelists now.
And um, I will hand it off to Dr. Ellen Feingold, who's the curator of the National Numismatic Collection at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian, um, to begin by posing some questions to our panelists and to see if the panelists have questions for each other. But for the attendees, I invite you to put your comments and questions in the Q&A in the chat, and we'll get those um, yielded and answered as well. Ellen. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much to the panelists for such a vibrant discussion and so many interesting um, insights into Anna Mae Wong's life and the development of the quarter. I see that Anna Wong is with us and she has added a few comments into the chat. So I first just wanted to invite her um, to make any remarks she might like to make or any comments about the presentations uh, that we just heard. And, and I believe, Anna, you can unmute yourself and speak. If the Hi, guys. Is willing. Ah, beautiful. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, yep. great. I am so sorry. I am in the middle of, I'm about to jump on another Zoom call for work, but I really want to thank everyone who is listening and everyone who's taking part in the webinar. It's been amazing. Everybody's been so generous and kind about my aunt. My family is so proud. And honestly, it's been a joy to work with everyone at the Smithsonian, the men. I've met so many amazing people that all they want to do is honor my aunt. And I, I really, I, I am just blown away by this whole presentation, this webinar. It's great. I, I really thank everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's really uh, an extra special honor um, and makes it that much more me memorable. Ellen. Yeah, absolutely. And Bill, there was another question about the Entertainment Nation exhibition and where it can be seen, right? I think you wanted to answer that. Ryan, I think you put it, or someone, Ryan or, or Theo, put it in the Q&A. Maybe, maybe you can just go over there. Oh, yeah, Theo, Theo answered it, but I, I can just explain a little bit to say that um, the exhibit is at the National Museum of American History in D.C. Um, on the third floor west wing of the museum. It will be there on view for at least 20 years, so you have plenty of time to come and see it. Um, but, uh, you know, as with any museum exhibition, um, our chief priority is to make sure that the objects will survive, that we're caring for them best we can. So, um, you know, we have conservators on staff or material scientists who check the condition of um, especially the fabrics and textiles and, um, and paper objects that are there. And so we're planning on rotations at least every year to keep the content fresh uh, and, and put new collections in. So uh, even if you do come to see it one time, you can come again and see new things. And that's why we're still collecting and you know hoping to get things like these uh, anime Wong objects on display in the next few years. Thanks, Ryan. I don't currently see any questions in the chat from our audience. So I wondered if the panelists have any questions for each other. And if not, I can start with a question. Maybe I'll start us off. Um, and please jump in, panelists, as, as questions come to your minds. I wondered um, if you might all take the opportunity to reflect a little bit on the scale of the public reaction to this quarter, I, the entire quarter, um, new quarter program. But this quarter in particular has, um, as, as you mentioned, Tracy, gotten a lot of attention uh, from the media. It has certainly been a major source of interest um, with many demographics in the public. And I wondered if you could reflect a little bit on that. And, um, and on this question about whether change is still relevant, whether coins are still relevant and what this particular quarter and the big public reaction to it can tell us about that. Let me jump in there, uh, Ellen. It's a great question. Um, uh, I, I think um, uh, that as, uh, as an image on currency, it is uh, a powerful symbol, and like a lot of symbols, the idea of of these symbols are are um, reflections of a people's values, um, and it is it's striking to see the sea change in American culture because if we consider um, how she's evaluated now versus the the ways in in which Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans. Uh, we're dealing with the prevailing attitudes against Asians during her lifetime. It's really, it, it really doesn't even compare. I mean, we're talking about people who were in her community uh, and other Asian American and California communities quite aware of the Chinese Exclusion Act, of the Page Act, 
uh, of of nearly a, um, a century of anti-Asian legislation at the federal level in order to exclude, to deport, to discriminate against Asian Americans. And it's really quite telling to see how the culture has has shifted and it in many ways it it has come around to to validate the presence of Asian Americans and, and specifically in this case an Asian American woman actor. Um, in that sense, to register that change is important. Um, and and it is an important moment to say that that things can change uh, in in a society. And and certainly one way to do that is to is to make sure that the symbols uh, are available for people to draw inspiration from. Uh, I think what a lot of folks in the Asian American community and Pacific Islander communities as well would hope is that we we understand not only that there's symbolic change necessary, but also material change necessary, and that the that the violence and the attitudes uh, against Asian Americans that have still been prevalent, that have actually been reconjured as a result of the pandemic, um, hopefully that um, that that also must change as well. Um, so we we have to. Um, to celebrate the the victories where we can find them, uh, to note where change in society has taken place, but also realize that beyond the symbolic change, there's also the real material work of of what's needed to address um, um, the 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 lived experiences of of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders today. I'd like to jump onto that. Thank you, Theo. Um, that's really important. Um, there's. Uh, API data has put it out that 30% of Americans are not aware about the increase in anti-Asian American hate. Um, it's increased 150% um, from 2019 to 2021, um, and that is not acceptable. And having Anna Mae Wong on a quarter that is passed through people's hands on a daily basis is important because Asian Americans have been accused of carrying COVID. And they've been a key, an Asian American woman had been highly targeted in addition to the elderly. And so the fact that we have a Chinese American woman on a quarter and she's in our daily currency, that matters. Um, I also think that it's important because most women in the United States make less than 75% per dollar that a man makes for the same amount of work, the same credential. And so that's very symbolic that it's on a quarter. Um, Unfortunately, during the pandemic, Latinx and African-American women made like 52% um, of, of a dollar. And so I think, again, it speaks to that material need for us to be aware of this inequality. And so it's wonderful and important that we have these symbolic changes, but we need to keep really fighting for and pushing for the actual material change as well. And I, I really appreciate everyone here because the educational outreach, the work you all do, that's how we raise awareness. That's how we help create change. Thank you so much. Those were wonderful um, thoughts about this question. Are there any, any other panelists who wanted to weigh, on it, weigh in on this particular topic? Michelle, do I see you? I would love to weigh in on this from the Please. quarter perspective. Um, so the quarter, first off, is the workhorse coin that we have at the Mint. That is the one that you are going to see out there, so much of it. Um, it's also where the change is more permanent. And I'm saying this in change in quarters, and I hope that then it reflects into change in society. Um, but this is something that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, young girls and young boys will find one of these quarters, turn it over and find someone who looks like them or is interested in what they were interested in, and know that they matter, you know, and that what they want to do with their life matters. You know, and I just, I think that is so inspirational. Some of these kids are never going to get to see the amazing exhibits, you know, at, at the Smithsonian's, but they might be able to hold a quarter. And that's what I get out of this program. You know, that for me is, has been the most uplifting. Um, also the reaction to this, um, we were, the, the Anime Wong Quarter was trending on Twitter, I think, as, or Yahoo, it was trending as, as the top search right after we released it. That never happens for a circulating coin, let's be honest. Um, so to see the number of people who are excited about this quarter, you know, and this program, that's how I know that we're, we're on the right track. We're doing the right thing. Um, and I've also had a, 
I've had people who come up to me and ask me, how do I get one? Where do I find one? Or even tell me, hey, my mom just called me because she found three of the quarters in Florida. You know, so I, I get the quarter reports from friends and colleagues, which are always exciting. Um, so I, I having the opportunity to be able to celebrate women like Anna Mae Wong um, is so fundamentally necessary right now for our country. And I am thrilled that we're able to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Michelle. One of the things that really um, came across in all of your remarks was how important it is that the, this quarter is a starting point for a broader educational initiative. And so I wondered um, if any of you, and particularly Theo and Ryan maybe, can speak to whether there are um, now or will be in the future educational resources about Anna Mae Wong and her as a great um, conversation starter for some of these wider issues that it is so important that we address and, and make available to educators around the country and, and globally. I'm sure that Theo, you can speak a little bit more to this and the sort of broader institutional uh, goals, you know, for for this kind of history. But certainly, we're continuing to look at um, new possibilities, you know, to do screenings, to do uh, talks. And I see there's a, a question in the chat uh, also about you know whether there are guided tours, there are guided tours of the Entertainment Nation exhibition. So on site, um, you know, there are opportunities to to learn more. Um, but then we're looking at those opportunities, yeah, for um, certainly, you know, curriculum resources. I mean, part of it is just getting these, these objects photographed and out there and writing the, you know, detailed records that people can use these in, in classrooms. We're hoping to talk about her story. Um, I love what you said, Michelle, about, you know, the idea of having the quarter in your hand to start the conversation, you know, that that's something that even if you can't come to the Smithsonian, you have. But, you know, we want to be the landing page for people who do want to find more and, you know, be able to then come to our website and learn about her story. Um, through our exhibit and the resources that we were able to marshal there as well. Yeah, let me pick up uh, where Ryan uh, left off there. Um, he and I, are, our colleagues, we're actually in the same division. So we, we've been working together with Anna uh, to get these objects into the exhibit. So we're really excited about uh, being able to tell those stories. Uh, the stock and trade of any museum is, is having the objects in the collection. And without the objects, it's just that much more difficult to tell the story. So now that we have these objects, it it is... Um, you know the the sky's the limit in terms of being able to to produce different kinds of educational products, whether it's podcasts or blog posts. Um, uh, I know that the our colleagues over at the Asian Pacific American Center, the American Women's History Initiative, are creating uh, learning lab modules, which are online lesson plans that any educator can access. Uh, those are going to be really uh, useful uh, in an online environment in any kind of classroom situation. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to be able to share all of this material in, in that way. And uh, I just want to pick up this question that Shiwei raised in the chat about the, about uh, everything everywhere all at once and crazy rich Asians and, and whether or not they honored the memory of anime Wong. I, I, I think uh, in, in many ways, all of this represents kind of part of the larger tradition of Asian Americans in cinema. And, and if anyone who got a chance to see Michelle Yeoh's acceptance speech at the Golden Globes uh, just recently for, for Best Actor, uh, it was really quite striking. You know, um, in, in many ways, it's it's as if the ghost of Anna Mae Wong was speaking through her. Um, or if maybe we can imagine it another way uh, of, of having Anna Mae Wong's ghost in that audience, uh, of having Michelle speak directly to her. Um, these are long fights that Asian American women have have struggled over um, in their daily careers. And, and being quite pragmatic and blunt, being um, you know, hard-headed uh, about not being discouraged in, in a time, whether it's the 1920s or the or the 2020s, it's really quite amazing to see Asian American women demonstrate the tenacity to keep pursuing. Uh, their cinematic dreams and the narrative arcs that I think we all need. Um, and so it's it's really quite amazing to to see that. And so I think they're all of a piece. Um, you know, over time, uh, members of our communities have debated the what would be the proper representations of Asian American women or or men on film. Uh, and I think in, not to say that those aren't important, but um, you know, over the long arc, I think we have to see the long arc of how these stories um, are are presented and how they're consumed. Um, and so, I, I would say they're all part of a longer tradition that we can connect, and uh, that's what we hope uh, our visitors will be able to do when they come to the Smithsonian. 
uh, either in person or uh, digitally, is to be able to make those kinds of connections with Anna Mae Wong, with Michelle Yeoh, with um, Constance Wu, and, and so many others that have been trying to ask and answer the same questions that Anna raised in her uh, 1930s article, I Protest. Um, I'm just going to follow up to you oh, again. Please, Karen, yeah, okay. um, I just taught everything everywhere all at once in my AP, Asian Pacific American Genders and Sexualities course at Asia State University. And I taught Crazy Rich Asians in my course when I taught it in 2018. Um, and it was interesting because Crazy Rich Asians really, in some ways, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore has always said, um, you know, when you try to solve so solve problems, you can some create new differences. When you address differences, you create new differences. And one of the things that my students and I talked about was that in Crazy Rich Asians, it really limited it to a certain type of Asian American or Asian perspective. And so, like you saw, the South Asians who were the servants of the ethnic Chinese Singaporeans um, and, and the lack of diversity in the representation. And I think that um, that was something that's hard is that we have to also keep in mind the power of cinema, the power of representations to also limit to think that we're only East Asian and that's totally not true. South Asians, Filipinx, those are really important uh, large populations in our, our communities and, and then the smaller populations also are really vital and we get aggregated together and just aggregating that data is so important for justice and to meet the needs of our population. So I just wanted to note that. I think that also with everything, every wall at once, Michelle Yeoh is tremendous. That film, it talks about the intersectionality through the multiverse. It's such an important way of bringing to life the everyday struggles of immigrants and their children, the intergenerational trauma. I think that what I really love about that film is especially the Asian American masculinity. Because one of the things that often, you know, the folk, we see so much overrepresentation in Hollywood of Asian American women, but Asian American masculinity in all its diversity is often not as well developed. And so even though I know we're talking about the Woman in Courage program, I hope it's okay to mention that what Wayman does is really an important rehabilitation and reclamation of the possibilities of masculinity and how they've been limited by structural racism and sexism and so forth with um, the way it's happened historically. So, um, and I, I would just give a shout out to Millianne King's uh, Reproducing Asian American Studies article for anyone who wants to read a really important article about reproductive exclusion and how it ties together a lot of these different threads of history that have come up throughout the talk today. Thank you so much, Karen and everyone. I um, I just wanted to make a further plug as well for Learning Lab um, as a great educational uh, resource and a place that educators can create their own lesson plans using objects from the collection. So what Ryan and Theo were talking about, step one, bringing the objects into the museum, giving us the tools to talk about a person like Anna Mae Wong. But then once that's there, Learning Lab is a platform where educators anywhere can use those objects to create their own lesson plans and then share those. So this can be you know, a team effort um, with people in the museum and people outside the museum together making these objects do the hard work of the education beyond you know, the quarter. Um, we have two great questions that kind of go together. So I'll read them both and then see if anyone wants to jump in on them. Um, Caitlin Heslin asks, do you think, do you all think that the slow phasing out of cash and coins for business will affect the impact of the new quarters? Our friends from the Mint might, might want to weigh in on that. And then the second one is, um, I'm interested to, from Lila, I'm interested to know if there are any studies on the subjective impacts of money redesign that expands aspects of minority representation. So these are sort of related to each other. Um, anyone want to jump in on either of those? I can start a little bit on the first one. Um, so we produce circulating coinage to the demand of the Federal Reserve Bank. And I can tell you that um, the slowing down of, of people using coins has been a topic on our radar for quite a few years. Um, right now, with the demand from the Fed, it is exceeding 
what we have produced in the last few years of our last quarter's program um, and are doing everything possible to keep up with the increased demand. You know, so whether or not we eventually have um, a slowdown is something we will have to tackle at that time. You know, the Mint does have that on our radar and, and we're working through it. Um, but right now, again, we are close producing close to half a billion of these quarters, um, each of these honorees quarters and sending them to the Federal Reserve Bank, who then takes these quarters and distributes it to all the, the banks and financial institutions throughout the country. I see we have another comment in the chat, you know, talking about still the limits of that circulation and that, you know, we, we often see with new coins, this isn't just true for this program, this is true for coins throughout history, that when a new coin is released, it doesn't circulate evenly across, you know, a country or a state. Um, so I don't know if our friends from the Mint want to weigh in on that too, you know, how this works. We realize you guys are the producers, the Federal Reserve, you know, plays a different, more distributive role here, but would you like to speak to that at all? Sure. Um, I can simply say that when when we do ship the quarters over to the Federal Reserve, we don't have um, we don't have the ability to determine where those quarters go. You know, that's based and and created by the Fed based upon the need of the financial institutions. Um, we also cannot stipulate that these are the first these, these quarters have to be shipped before any other quarters that they may have um, happen. So unfortunately, the Mint doesn't have the ability to um, to work with that, but we could take this feedback back to the, the Federal Reserve um, in one of our many conversations with them so they are aware. I will tell you, keep looking. You know, keep looking, keep asking. Uh, we see that coin velocity from the time it leaves us to the time it, it gets into circulation is generally around three to four weeks. So keep your eyes open. You will find them. And I just wanted to add, um, we work with the Smithsonian, the National Women's History Museum to produce public programs to honor each of the quarters. Uh, and we've been able to um, give each audience member one of the quarters. Um, in addition, we'd be able to provide quarters at, at different learning tools for, for schools. Um, so we do try to do as much public outreach um, as possible so as many people could get the quarters, um, learn about it, and hopefully add it to their collection. Thank you, Tracy. If, if I could just jump in too, I mean, I've, I've always wondered about this sort of trade-off between um, wider circulation and then things because they're new and exciting and interesting always getting pulled out of circulation because people want to collect it and um my my own little kind of story about this is i have a friend who was obsessed with getting every single one of the national parks orders and she was like if you ever see the samoa park one just save it save it for me and so i ended up with like five or six of them because i i had in my head i must save these for my friend but then, of course, like, you know, when would I get around to sending them? I don't even know if I ever did. So I just wonder if that's sort of a thing that's going on as well, that these things are circulating, but people are pulling them out of circulation to hold on to them. I'm sure we're seeing people pulling them out. Um, that was actually one of the reasons, too, when we decided to go to a shorter program. We had two 12-year back-to-back programs, I mean, the 50 State Quarters and the America the Beautiful Quarters program. And when we started doing market research to prep for this new legislation, we heard from people that it is really hard to collect all 12 years. And I started this with my children, and they were seven when we started with the, uh, the America the Beautiful Parks, and they were so excited. And here we are, they're 17, 18, 19, and I'm filling the books by myself. So this program is a four-year program. The next program is a one-year program followed by another four-year program. So we are paying attention to what people are interested in collecting and trying to help them out in that way too. Thank you, Tracy. Are there, uh, um, Michelle, sorry, are there other, other questions that the panelists have, other remarks that the panelists wanted to make in the remaining time we have? Anything else in the chat? Ellen, can I ask you a question? Of course. As you know, an, another colleague at the American History Museum, can you mm -hmm. talk about how you collect these commemorative quarters and whether this quarter will be joining your collection at, at the National Numismatics Collection? 
Yes, it absolutely will. Thank you, Ryan. So I am the curator of the National Numismatic Collection, which is our national collection of record. And that means that we hold the collection of the U.S. Mint, as well as the collections of the Treasury and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. And part of that privilege and responsibility means that each year we receive transfers from the U.S. Mint of all of the new products that they produce, um, both in proof form, which is a kind of sh shiny, fancy version, and then in the form that would circulate. Um, so we will certainly receive this quarter and all of the other quarters in this program. And it's an important part of keeping a sort of national record of the history of our currency, our coins. Um, but in terms of studying women in particular, it's a really effective way to see when you look at the collection um, where we've been and then where we might go. You know, it's it's already been said here that there have been very few um, historic women, women, excuse me, featured on coins and banknotes. And so these quarters will be a pretty stark change in our cabinets um, from the way in which American coins have looked over the last nearly 250 years. So it's very exciting um, for us in the National Numismatic Collection, and it's awesome to have colleagues um, just down the hall who are collecting the artifacts that really um, bring to life the history of the person that we'll see on the surface of the coin. You know, there's been a lot of um, white men on currency, and then there have been I didn't know if the Indian heads were related to the bounties placed on American Indians, you know, in the um, settlement days, but I was wondering, is there ever going to be um, a plan to put men of color on on coins and, and, and cash because, you know, there's, we, have, we don't think intersectionally, right, we're not capturing a lot of the need for inclusivity. Yes, you know, this is a great question, and I, I can put a slightly different hat on um, and very carefully remark on this. The program that Michelle referenced, the upcoming one-year program, is the 2026 program. Michelle, shake your head if I'm saying something I shouldn't be saying. But this is national legislation um, that our, our circulating coins will change to honor the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And over the course of that year, all of our coins will... Um, will look uh, different and will represent the mints and the public's vision for how to celebrate and commemorate the signing of the Declaration of, of Independence. So um, one of the things that the committee that I'm on that's discussing this uh, has been discussing is how important it is that those coins represent a much uh, broader body of people than have previously been represented on coins um, and, and much uh, broader body of imagery than the way in which our, our declaration has previously been represented. So I think it's highly likely that we're in the very early stages of doing this work on this committee, that you will see um, many people of color, that you will see images that reflect um, a broader body of um, contributors to the history of our nation, not just around 1776, but hopefully over the span of the 250 years since. So yes, I think that's highly likely. And then as far as um, banknotes are concerned, you may all recall that in uh, 2015, 2016, the Obama administration had announced a change to our um, currency. We, of course, haven't seen that yet um, in terms of in our pockets and, and our wallets. But one of the banknotes was supposed to feature Dr. Martin Luther King on um, the five. And so there have certainly been discussions um, within the Treasury and the Bureau of Engraving and Printing um, and across government about how outdated our banknotes look in many ways and how important it is that there is a vision for the future that includes imagery that's more inclusive. So I think it's highly likely that we will see that. But banknotes change much more slowly than coins. It takes a very long time to redesign a banknote um, because of the anti-counterfeiting features, because of the um, considerations that the Federal Reserve Bank makes around supply and demand. We won't see that happen um, like, like we can see a change to our quarters so quickly. And Michelle, feel free to jump in. I think you've covered it really well. Thank you. Any other questions or remarks? This has been a wonderfully vibrant conversation and um, a real privilege to talk with all of you today about this. And Bill, is there anything final that you wanted to say? Well, there's there's one one final question got put oh. in the chat about can, about going to the bank to get a roll of the new quarters as they rolled out um, and the parks quarters not being available like that anymore. So how can rolls of the new quarters be sent to banks again? Or I guess really the question is how can we get our hands on them. 
I would keep asking your bank again the, the Fed will they have these quarters they will be sending them out. Um, they are sending them out, you should start seeing them in your either at your bank or um, in your change. I'll, I'll give a good example from um, from the history of American coins that kind of speaks to this when the US changed from the large size cent to the small size cent, people got very upset. This was in the middle of the 19th century. They felt um, very uh, dispossessed of their favorite coin. And so suddenly people began collecting the large size cent very aggressively because they were afraid that they were never going to see it again. And it became like a top collector's item. <laughs> um, and still is something that if you ask American collectors, something that they're passionate about collecting or that they collected in their youth, people talk about that large size cent. So um, people grabbing onto something that they feel connected to and coins being such an easy thing sometimes for the average person to grab onto instead of an experienced collector per se, um, I think is, is probably at play here. But I think it probably speaks to how successful um, this coin has been, how much interest there is um, in the public and how much passion there is um, for learning more about Anna Mae Wong and about the other women in the series. So as hard as it is to not be able to get your hands on it, it also um, is not the first time in history we've seen this. And I think it really is a testament to the coin's success. Well, well thank you. I, I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for sharing your insight and expertise on this webinar this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, it's just been incredibly illuminating and just such a remarkable way to remember and honor the legacy of Anna Mae Wong and all that she stood for and will stand for in our coins and in circulation um, in the future. So to everyone at the Smithsonian and the Mint, thank you. To Karen from ASU, thank you so much. Um, Fran will be sending out the recording of this webinar to everyone who attended along with any of the resources or citations that were mentioned along the way. So if you're hoping for that, you'll get it. Um, and we'll post it on the UCI Social Sciences website as well. Um, but with that, thank you to all the attendees who stayed with us through this, uh, through this session. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. And let's make change with change. <laughs>